Yeah, so like, tell us like, obviously the experiences in LA, like growing up in LA, like, would you say it's changed you into a different person, like just going through everything that you've gone through? Yeah, I think without me going through all the stuff that I went through in LA, I wouldn't be the person I am now. Yeah. Um, I'd probably be a tow truck driver. I'd be, you know, owning different trucks, you know, about business and not helping the community. I think uh, everything that happened to me made it to where I didn't want it to happen to my children. Mm. So my selfishness wanted to reduce violence because I don't want my children, I don't want them to be victims, but I don't want my children to be suspects of homicides either. Yeah. I don't want the door getting kicked in because they hurt somebody. So I don't want my children hurt, but I don't want them hurting others as well. So I selfishly do this work to make sure that I help my children, my community's children, the neighboring community's children, and um, it turns into, you know, citywide, countywide of Los Angeles, even, um, you know, nationwide, mm. all the way from California to Georgia, you know, helping uh, as much as I can with so other people. So you Georgia as well, yeah? Yeah, so, so we have a, Yeah. So, so you, you got, obviously, I heard that you got other ambassadors that are helping you as well. Yeah, so they're yeah. ambassadors. Um, Family violence ambassadors. So it's not the same as L.A. You know, L.A., we have intervention. We have ambassadors who are, um, you know, tied to the community. But in Georgia, we have family violence ambassadors who work okay. directly with the families. And you help homeless people as well. I'm hearing yeah, homeless, so, mental health. Yeah, mental health is our main thing, yeah. you know, that we do. No, I respect the mental health thing as well because if you do see some of my videos, I had my own experiences myself where... I nearly took my own life a few times and I obviously come out the other side and it's the reason why I am committed to help people as well, you know. So whether it's like mental health or just guiding the kids off the streets because the streets are affecting the mental health. That's well, why definitely. it all comes down in one. Like we can go into that as well, like gangs and PTSD. Yeah, so you know what you said, PTSD. And, mm -hmm. and if I think of PTSD as something that's post, but if it's currently reoccurring, if it happens every day, it's not post. So, you know, we talk about Nipsey being killed, but then, like you said, Mo3 got killed, King Von got killed, Young Dolph got killed, PNB Rock got killed. So it's take constantly, off killed, Takeoff yeah, got yeah, killed. Yeah, yeah, it's so constantly much. reoccurring. Yeah. So it's not post. I haven't got over, you know, my kids introduced me to King Von's music, right? So I'm listening to King Von. I'm like, oh, he's a good storyteller. And... And then two days later, he got killed. And I'm like, yeah. wow, why? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with that. But then this other rapper got killed. Mo3, he's on the freeway. What? And then after that, uh, the duck, duck had got yeah, killed before yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. FGB duck. And I'm thinking to myself, what is killing yeah. these young people? And that's not even taken away from all the other shootings that happen in L.A. Mm. So as all these shootings are happening... When do we get to recover? The shootings every night in LA. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was two days ago. Three Beverly people. Hills, yeah. Well, it's right outside of Beverly Hills, yeah. yeah but yeah, seven yeah. people shot, three of them died Hollywood immediately. Hollywood as well. There was a shots fired last yeah. morning or something. Yeah, so you, you, you figure when do we get over it? We never yeah. get to get over it because even as we speak today, something's going to happen tonight, tomorrow, yeah, but today. The question after. is, yeah, it's like why is it reoccurring? Like, is it, is it easy access to the guns? Yeah, like, what, why, like, how can, like, what can we do, or they do, the system, to, to, to make a change? Like, what can they do? I think, number one, you said it earlier when you talked about ego. Mm. Some people have the ego and the insecurities, the self-insecurities that lead to mental health. Some people use drugs that lead to mental health. Yeah. Um, so to address the mental health, but also to address the guns, and the, but more importantly, to ag address the anger. Like, it's okay for me to get angry, but I shouldn't hurt somebody. So all these things coming together is what has to be addressed, not just one. That's like if there's mosquitoes, and I take a swatter, and I start swatting them one at a time, but it's a thousand of them. I'm going to get 10 or 15, but they're going to keep reproducing. No, so I have, to, I have to get to what is the core, what is the root cause mm. of the mental health, the feeling of being insecure, the feeling of um, low self-esteem, the feeling of depression in men. I got to get to the cause of that and then give 
a healthy environment for them to be able to talk about it, to get help for it. But at the same time, I got to talk about the ego. Why is somebody tiny killer? Mm. And that's not you. You're Theodore, you're Charles, you're Clarence. Let me get you back to wanting to be who you really are and not creating this alter ego. Mm. You know, like some people talk about, uh, you know, the movie Superman, right? Well, he's really Clark Kent, you know? So can I get these individuals to be Clark Kent? You don't have to be Superman in the street. Yeah, can yeah, you be yeah. Clark Kent now? You know, can I help you become healthy so that your family will be healthy? Your family's not healthy if you're Superman. Your family's mm -hmm. healthy if you're Clark Kent. Yeah. So we have to address these things, but also address the environment. Law enforcement, they see Tiny Killer, Baby Shooter. They don't see Clarence. They don't see Charles. They don't see, you know, Terrence or whatever. They see, oh, that's Baby Shooter. He has a gun. And, and now they want to uh, address our community as if it's war. Mm -hmm. The war on gangs. The war on drugs. It's the war on our community. It's the war on our people. Mm. All across the world, there's a so war on stop black people. It like that. It's never going to stop, basically. Exactly. Yeah. That's like swatting one mosquito at a time. Mm. Let's figure out where is this mosquito attitude coming from? How do we stop it? So let's take you back to, obviously, 1970s, like late 1970s, when there was not a lot of bloods. There was mainly Crips and, like, the war on gangs and, and drugs, whatever they say it is, yeah. the police. Is that worse than now than it was then? What, what had happened back then in the early 1980s when the crack epidemic hit, um, there were people who was were... Was it late 90s then, yeah? No, it really started in the 80s. 80s. And it led into the early 90s. Not yeah. the late 90s, early 90s. But what happened is we have families who sold their homes. Mm. So the black population started losing ownership of their homes. The men started going into prison. The women that used drugs hit the streets and were no longer the, the mothers and the grandmothers. A lot of children went into a uh, foster care system, went into um, Department of Children and Family Services. Mm. So now they're in placement. A lot of the girls there were getting, um, were getting raped or getting uh, molested, things of that nature. And it just, it led to where we lost our community. Okay, the so black community was yeah. no longer 65, 70% of Los Angeles County. We're down now to about 8%, but during the 80s and 90s, um, home ownership, we lost that. Uh, educated black people, we lost the majority of them. Wow. Uh, we used to have trades. We could work with our hands, build houses and build stuff and all that was lost because of what happened with the crack in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s. That's mad, I didn't even know that. Yeah. So now it's obviously obviously calmed down a little bit now. It's calmed down, but people have left. But there was no um, crystal meth back then, was there? Crystal meth didn't come till like mid 90s, like around 96, 97, but it, when it came, it really didn't hit the black community the way it is now. Mm -hmm. Crystal meth um, in the 90s was in you know, uh, poor rural areas of uh, Riverside, San Bernardino, out here in California. Mm -hmm. And um, like the end of the 90s, it really hit hard in uh, L.A. So by the time, the early 2000s, it was a epidemic of crystal yeah, meth. Yeah, and it's obviously you can see around now. Yeah. A lot of people are still, like, tweaking and going crazy on the streets, man. It's definitely crazy, like, me being here, I haven't been here so long and seeing how rich the area is, but how poor the streets are, you know? Like, I've taken in a lot around me, man, and it's just crazy, man. And, like, yeah. there's no saving them, like, no one can help them. It's like, there's no... It was in it, their mental um, homes stopped in 1985, I think they were saying. Yeah, so in yeah, 1980s, so. we had a president named Ronald Reagan, Mm. And the very first thing he did in 1980s was he did, uh, him and this guy named Howard Jarvis, they did a tax reform to where they lowered the amount of taxes that people paid on their homes. Mm. So multi-million dollar homes paid the most taxes. Well, once he reversed that, that stopped having the money for the schools. So we lost wood shops. We lost automotive. We lost all the things that were in the high school that taught people how to work with their hands. Mm. So that led to a problem because now we don't have music classes. We don't have any of those classes. And then when you get to lower economic communities, those houses were worth 100000 at the most 200000 
So it was very minimum taxes that were going to the schools. So that means the schools with and the lower economic communities, they got the less resources okay. than the schools. And, the, and then the second thing he did was he shut down all the mental health yeah, facilities. That, yeah. And he said, okay, so we don't have a mental health crisis. So he's taking the money that went to mental health. And now all the people who are in the mental health facilities, they can't afford to keep them. So they put them on the streets. And now we have what we know today as Skid Row, a homeless population at Venice Beach, uh, Long yeah, Beach, everywhere. Yeah, Long yeah, Beach yeah. clean theirs up a, a lot, but they're still there's everywhere. There's still a lot of homeless. There's still, no, yeah. I see it. And that, that yeah. came because all the mental health facilities lost their funding. Mm. So they had to do something else. They, you know, people follow the funding cycle. Even though it doesn't cure mental health like the hospitals, it does take an edge off it and it can get them leading up to living a normal life, you know? Exactly. And, yeah, so I'm just going to um, change it up now and just ask you about second call. Like, when did it first come around? And like, what was the first steps you done to start in second call? And, and after, go into depth about second call, if you can. Yeah. So second call started in 2006. And it's because my mentor, Darren Bo Taylor, he had an organization called Unity One. And he worked hand in hand with... Uh, famous football player named Jim Brown out here in America, right? He's probably one of the top 10 football players. But when I got into Unity One, they started bumping heads. They were not getting along. And um, I needed to be in the streets with Bo Taylor, but I needed that American curriculum that Jim Brown had. So Bo told me that I didn't need the curriculum. He said, man, discuss dysfunction with your community, with your family, and the schools. He said, all it is is dysfunction. So that's when Second Call started. I started Second Call because I, I saw the friction between them, went into the schools and talked about dysfunction. And I let the children in the school tell me what dysfunction was. And they spoke to their own experiences. So what I learned from that is that I don't want to fix the problem. I don't want to tell them what they should do. I'm not a teacher, but I want to give them an emotionally safe place to talk about how to deal with anger. It's just like that your gang members and that we're talking about, yeah? So I'm talking about children, okay, because when children, we say gang bro. members, then we, we forget the fact that they have a mom and dad. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to say a gang, gang member, members. because then what's the difference? Yeah, yeah, and what does a difference. gang member look like? Mm. All the children go to school, some of them might be violent. So let's ask that, like, you know, like, what, did you ha just have one day, like, just have a thought, I just want to start this this new journey where I want to help. Like, how did it come around? Like, no, it was... was, he, was he, did you tell someone and did it become yeah. a plan? Like, tell us a bit so about I, that. So I told um, one of my friends, Kenny Smith, we call him mm. Big Monster. Um, I told him that, you know, hey, we got to follow these Unity One American guys. There was a guy named Looney who talked about developing a desire for success. And the way he spoke, he spoke like he was a college graduate. So I said, man, we got to do this. Um, and Big Monster, he was making a sandwich in the kitchen. And everything I said, he said, yeah. I said, man, we got to do this. He said, yeah. I said, we got to create an agency. He said, yeah. Uh, you know, and I was like, man, you're not even listening to me. Man. Everything I say, you're saying, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I just gave it some deep thought. And, um, and uh, I said, hey, the second chance at love and life. When I was in prison, there was a Muslim imam who asked me if I loved my life. And I said, yeah, I love my life. And he said, man, you've been living your life, but you haven't been showing it love. He said, Have you, did you love your, do you love your children? I said, yeah, I love my children. He said, do you love them enough to die for them? Mm. And I said, yeah, oh, yeah, I die for my kids. He said, well, then you're not loving your kids or your life okay. because these are the same people that mm. need you to live. Why would you die for some people who need you to be alive? He said, do you see how you living without love? And so when he said that to me, I blew it off like, Psst, that's stupid. But when I was sitting in the kitchen talking to a uh, big monster and he kept saying, yeah, yeah. I had that flashback. I had that memory. And I said, oh, this is this is it right here. Second chance at love and life. Hmm. I said, man, we're going to be second call. Second chance at love and life. And you know what he said? He said, yeah, yeah. Man, you second said, yeah, call, that's everything. a second chance. No, that's serious. I like that, man. Yeah. Second chance at loving life. Second Not call. just living it, but loving it. Like, we're taking you back in the hood when you was obviously gangbanging. And like something happened where you could have died. Like any, And you oh, got plenty away. Plenty of times, man. Plenty of times. Because I know times. you've been through a lot. I can tell. Yeah. 
Like any, any, just any one little so, story. One, one of the things that scared me the most was my little brother was 16 years old. Mm. And um, we're at a party. It's 1992. It's the peace treaty. So mm. all the Crips and Bloods are getting along. We're supposed to be together. The peace treaty, yeah? Yeah. So this came after the Rodney King verdict. You know, mm. there was already a peace treaty coming. But, um, you know, anyway, we're at a party and big old giant Crips big one, six foot eight type crips, right? <laughs> they were they were telling me and, and Big Monster that my friend had to lead a party. They called him a Mexican. And he's light skinned. He's about your complexion, but mm. they said the Mexican gotta go and we like, man, he, he's with us. He ain't going nowhere. And um so we standing up, you know, we're all bit of five <laughs> nine, five ten, looking at all them and Monster said, Man, my squad against yours, we'll take y'all. And I'm sitting there like, man, all these dudes, six, eight, six, seven. But that wasn't the issue. The issue was um, everybody went and got guns. Mm -hmm. So as I'm telling my little brother and my friend, my friend about 5'5", five, five, I'm saying, hey, the Crips is tripping, man. We got to get up out of here. And we gave them enough time to go get their guns. By the time we got outside, I'm standing by the car, and they just started shooting the car. I don't know how they shot the door, the, the rims. They were shooting everything. Didn't shoot me. Fucking so everybody got to the other side of the car, and I saw my brother crawling like this. Shit. So I thought he got shot. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I, I can't even run to him. I had to run the other way. And I'm thinking, man, how am I going to call my mother? I shouldn't have had him here, this and that. Mm. Um, so as we're running, there's a girl with us. My friend, the one they called the Mexican, he hopped over the fence. I'm running. I put my foot on the fence. I hop over. I look back. She done flipped over the fence. She's hanging. Her oh, feet are hanging. Know. And she's saying, Skip, Skip. And my oh, friend is saying, shit. hey, that's not your girl, Skip. Leave her. Leave her. But it's, it's like Iraq. It's like shots being fired from every direction. And I'm like, a car pulls up and say, there you go. I'm like, he said, man, leave her. And he takes off. I said, I can't leave her. I'm already thinking my brother's down, down mm. the street because he was crawling. I go back and get her, help her up. The van hits the corner. We find out it's my friend Tick, the short dude. They come to get us. So we jump in the van. I'm like, where's my brother? Where's Monster? We don't know. We go look for Monster's truck. Monster's truck is gone. I said, oh, maybe my brother's with Monster, right? Uh, by the time we get back to our neighborhood, my little brother wasn't there. So we didn't get shot. We didn't get hurt. But now we like, oh, shit, we got to go find Skip Brother. So as we're driving down Adams, about a mile away from the party, we see my brother dodging in between a lot of cars. He don't know who to trust, so he's looking each and every direction, right? And uh, that was like one of the worst nights of my night of yeah. my life because it was total chaos. Everybody's just randomly shooting at everybody. Mm. We don't know who Did the enemy is. Did anyone even die that night? No one died. I really don't know. That's a crazy night. Yeah, man. that was a crazy night. But when I asked my brother, why did you get on the ground and start crawling? He was 16 and he saw all those army movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it probably saved his life. Yeah, that did save his life. Yeah, because if he'd have ran yeah, standing he up, shot. he might have got shot. 100%, so, man. You know, I was grateful, but I was so nervous. I was like, man, you got to go home. You can't hang out with me no more. That's crazy. That's a mad story, man. I appreciate you for sharing that story. Yeah. We're going to like... Obviously, not wrap it up. But I'm gonna ask you one, two more small questions. Like any like advice like for the new generation that like, work like that are up and coming now. Like, what would you advise them to stay on track and not like, not going into gangs? Like, what advice would you give? So for me, what I tell everybody is uh, what I said earlier. I want to get so busy that I'm moving in the direction towards my future. I don't want to get stagnated into what everybody wants me to be a follower. So if everybody's going to the movies and I know that they're probably going to fight or get into some problems, I don't want to go to the movies. If everybody I walk to school with has a knife or something like that, then I, I might not want to walk to school with them. I want to walk with the crowd that isn't getting into trouble. And if that's not my crowd, then I want to walk by myself. Mm. Um, but what, what I can say to those individuals who want to help in this work is to take different people to lunch. Take them and buy pizza, some chicken wings, 
sit down, have a, a sub sandwich or something, anything, and let those two individuals who don't get along have a dialogue, have a conversation. I think that's so important is to be able to bring a table right. where people could sit down and just talk. Doesn't have to be where I'm going to give advice. Doesn't have to be where I'm going to tell you what you should do. But, you know, when what we call gangs, I've been able to bring them to the table. And because I've brought them to the table, there are certain neighborhoods that aren't at war anymore. And I look at it, if I could do it, then anybody could do it. So if, you've actually put, like, two gangs together. And I've brought several gangs. I've brought, okay. right now as we speak, Nipsey's neighborhood, the Rolling Sixties, and the Inglewood families. They've been at war for over 50 years. And right now, to this day, they're not at war anymore. Yeah, I respect that, that you're, you're, you're stopping these gangs. So you said the Rolling, uh, Nipsey's gang and the other gang. The Rolling Sixties, the Inglewood yeah, so, families, so they're not. Is, they're I, not is the fighting. Inglewood family, are they bloods? Then? They're bloods. And then they're fighting Nipsey's crew. They, they fought for Do you reckon it's years. still going on now? Like, or? It's still going on. I just talked to a couple guys while I was in the bathroom, you know. Okay. So it, it's still, it's still, it's not as if it's a peace agreement. But it's just no war right now. Yeah. So we got one year. How many lives have been saved yeah, in that one year? Uh, I would the call East you Coast. like the Superman. So the, the East Coast yeah, Crips man. and the Florencias, uh, a black and brown gang, you know, a Mexican gang and a black gang, they've been at peace since November 1st mm. of 2019. And there's, there's no fighting, no war. They're actually helping each other. They're rebuilding relationships and building bonds. And and, and right, these that's like the question I don't I, I don't want to break. But why was they fighting in the first place? Is it because of their area, the gang? Like why? What, what no, was it, the was, first it was reason why because that? they were friends and somebody ran off with drugs. Okay. One guy decided I'm not going to pay uh, twenty, thirty thousand for these drugs. And is this years ago? Yeah, this was years ago. This was like 1997, 1998. Okay. Just said I'm not going to pay. So from 1998 to or it was even before that, it was like 1996, 97. Mm -hmm. They decided, okay, we're going to go to war. And they went to war with each other. Wow. That's all them years later, it's just never going to stop. And it stopped 2019. Mm -hmm. It stopped November 1st. So I, I say that to say that there's other examples as well. And what it takes sometimes is just buying people food and sitting at the table saying, so how do we move forward? What are we going to do now? Because everybody been killed, everybody been shot, everybody. How do we move forward? How do we, how do we make it to where nobody else gets shot? And, and they'll, they'll come up with the answers. I don't have to come up with it. They'll say, oh, if they stay over there, or if they stop coming writing on the walls, if they stay off Instagram, if they stay off TikTok with the video, you know, whatever it is, let them say what the answer is. But just, just have that table. Have those pieces of chicken, have that sandwich, have that mm. pizza for them so they could eat and talk yeah. about it. No, I agree with you. That's, that's, a, that's a great way of like, keeping the peace. And like you said before as well, if you want to leave, then it's not like, rocket science. You've just got to keep yourself so busy that you don't have to leave. You're just too busy. Isn't that right? Right. What we were saying. So it's, like, it's not like there's no way out. It's like you just have to find your way out. Right. It's been a great interview with Skip, and you know what, I've learned a lot from this interview, and um, I'm going to take this back on board, back to UK, and try and just spread this awareness, man, and, and yeah, put your knives down, your guns, and, and focus on what's important, you know, your family, and like I said on my last time, being nice is free, and it's priceless, so just spread the love. Yes, indeed. I, I think peace is priceless. You know, what's the cost of peace? Um, is it $100, $200, yeah. something to eat for people to sit and be at peace with one another? Whatever it costs, um, I'm willing to pay for it for, to make sure that no mother has to ever bury their child again, has to go to a cemetery. Um, whatever it takes, man, let's work together uh, internationally at bringing peace to our community. 100%, man. Defo, like, we'll be looking to bring you to the UK as well one day and get you working with us as well, man. That's, that's the main objective, and that's why we're here now, man. We want to, like, network with you lot, and we're on the same road, man, you know, making a change yes, for the sir. better community, man. So, appreciate once it, man. again, man, appreciate you, my Thank boy, you. man. Yes,